since we've got people still few to come, maybe we just leave it. Oh, maybe not. It's, fine. it's okay. It's okay. But better, better leave it closed. We're live. Okay, excellent. Great. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for making time to come in in person. And uh, good evening, everybody on YouTube. Uh, welcome, and uh, we are excited to be sharing with you another one of our gem jamming sessions this evening. Uh, this evening, we are going to be talking about clarity and carrot weight. Now, uh, these are two aspects of the um, value factors of jewelry that are interesting and maybe not quite as nuanced as the color aspect. If you joined us for uh, Tanya's talk on how important color is on colored gemstones, but they are very important to understand, and there are a few interesting things that are different from one category of gemstone to another that's really important to know. So we're excited to share this with you. This is um, a, a session that's going to be run by Tanya. Tanya Sadow is the founder of JDMIS, and uh, between Tanya and I, we run uh, these sessions at the National Design Center um, that are there to hopefully kind of help people appreciate more about their gemstones and their jewelry. We do sessions that have gemstone spotlights where you can find out more about individual gemstones. Uh, we zoom in on specific factors that are interested to know about uh, if you're working with uh, gemstones and jewelry, uh, things like clarity and carat weight, um, but also, you know, what do you make of synthetics? Um, how do you care and clean for your jewelry? And also we have a whole series of things on how jewelry is designed and how jewelry is manufactured using new technologies, using old technologies, all that sort of stuff. So we're pleased um, to have you join us again here at the National Design Center or on YouTube uh, for future sessions as well. Now, before we get going into the actual session itself, uh, some of you are new to the school and I wanted to share with you something more about who we are here at JDMIS. The easiest and fastest way for me to do that is to play a quick two minute video that tells you a little bit more about the JDMIS. So I'm going to switch to that. Since 2007, the Jewelry Design and Management International School has given thousands of people the confidence to create quality jewelry. Established in Singapore, in the heart of Southeast Asia, JDMIS has conducted courses for some of the world's most distinguished jewelry companies, as well as passionate amateurs and those ready for a career in the jewelry industry. Specializing in the jewelry arts, JDMIS provides exceptional education in jewelry design, fabrication, gemology, and business. The tools that students receive from JDMIS on their first day have traveled with many along the road of jewelry making success. Tanya Sadow, founder of the JDMIS, is an award-winning jewelry designer and renowned jewelry educator with over 30 years of experience training the jewelry industry. Tanya, with her team of expert jewelry artists and instructors, created the JDMIS curriculum to be comprehensive yet flexible. Small class sizes, personalized attention, and an unmatched support network ensure that each participant leaves with the knowledge, skill, and confidence to succeed in the jewelry industry. Designed for the jewelry trade, training at JDMIS is fast-paced and packed with useful practical information. But with a diverse range of participants, courses are also great fun. Learning at their own pace, participants study the latest information about gemstones and jewelry styles. They gain confidence using the best of traditional and contemporary techniques and learn how to apply each of these skills to their businesses. All JDMIS courses are completely modular and they can be taken individually. For each skill they learn, students receive a certificate and can combine these skills to receive a comprehensive diploma qualification. Graduates in more than 42 countries delight friends and relatives with their unique creations. Many graduates showcase their pieces online and JDMAS's brightest stars operate their own successful retail jewelry businesses 
designing and producing exquisite jewelry that enchants their customers. The possibilities are endless. What will you create? Fantastic. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming all this way tonight. And hello, YouTube and everyone on YouTube. And uh, let's get started. So we talk, we're going to talk about clarity and carrot weight. And you might wonder, how do these two, two go together? Well, Alex explained that they are part of the value factors. And color is such a big one that we do it individually. We've already done it. If you missed it, then please come and see it again, because these are sessions that do uh, reoccur. So come and see that one, which is very interesting. Cut is another one that covers a very large area. So tonight, we're going to just focus on the clarity and the carrot weight. So considerations for clarity. These are very important things. Let's have a look. Well, first of all, we're going to talk about opacity how transparent to opaque a gemstone can be and how that affects its value. Then we're going to look at the different gem types. The gem types are things that not many people have ever heard about. But think about this. If you have a gem that's usually highly included, how can you judge it against a gemstone that's always clean? Is it fair? It's kind of not very fair. So we have ways of you know, um, making sure that we uh, even up that playing field a little bit. And finally, we also want to take a look at some interesting inclusions that add value. And again, people think, how, does, how do inclusions add value? Yes, they can, they can actually add value. So we will see which ones and how they add value to the different pieces. Then we'll go on to the considerations on carrot weight. And we have to understand that if you're just working with one mineral, like diamonds, very simple. All diamonds are the same material. They're the same mineral, and therefore they all have the same specific gravity. But once you start looking at colored stones, there are so many different types of colored stones, and they all have different specific gravities, that's density. So you can't just look at one, at what size it is, and then guess what its weight is, because it doesn't work. You'd be, you could be very, very wrong if you did that. So we have to understand that. And there's a huge difference between, of course, diamonds and colored stones. And we do use charts that are going to help us. All right. So let us move on. We'll talk about opacity, transparent to opaque, first of all. Now, most people say, oh, I know what this is. This is very, very simple. Yes, transparent materials allow light to pass straight through, like a window pane. If we had a window pane, the light would pass right through. Or if somebody were, was passing by a window, you'd see them very clearly passing by. Translucent. Light is coming through, but maybe you don't see as clearly. We have a very nice window here with a gemstone on it. Now, we have cut out some areas, but it's got a kind of a frosted film on it. So when people pass by, they can't just see what we're doing straight through. They've got to look through the little areas that are transparent. So that is translucent, where light passes through, but you can't see very clearly through it. And finally, we have opaque, where no light passes through at all. Like a brick wall, you're not going to be able to get light through it. Now, the problem with everyone is that we have, we're completely full of all kinds of misconceptions. Right? We think we know what something is, and actually we don't know what it is. So I'm going to ask you, what is my finger? Is my finger opaque? Is it translucent? Or is it transparent? Very simple question. What? Yeah, a lot of people say opaque. Would you all agree? Yeah, what? Translucent. OK, some people say translucent. Good. If you said translucent, that's good. Because most people think your finger is your finger is opaque, right? Let's try it. Let's put a light, and let's put our light through the finger. You see that? So if we have misconceptions that are so simple, then what happens is that we really don't know how to judge gems properly. So we're going to have to understand 
Transparent, it, light passes through, you can see through it. Translucent, you can't really see clearly, but light passes through. And opaque, it's going to have no light. So this is like a lapis lazuli or a malachite, which never come in anything else than opaque. A lot of gemstones can come in translucent. Rose quartz is one example. Aventurine quartz is another example. And a lot of the ones that we truly love come in transparent, like your rubies and your emeralds and your sapphires. So why would something be opaque? Even a transparent material can become opaque. And it can become opaque if it has maybe some minerals in it that could be opaque, or if it has inclusions, lots of inclusions, that can make it a lot more translucent or even opaque, depending what those inclusions are. It could be something to do with its structural formation. It could be that it's had some kind of treatment which causes it to look opaque, or it could even be the cut and polish. If it's not done properly, then we can also have gems that are looking more translucent or opaque that way. So there are many, many reasons for it. But in most cases, the more transparent a gem is, the more likely it's going to be more valuable. And the less transparent it is, the less valuable it's going to be. You never see lapis or malachite reach the kind of prices that ruby or sapphire reach. So now let's take a look at why Gems are divided into three different categories. So when we judge a gemstone, we shouldn't judge them all in the same clarity category because it wouldn't be fair. So what we have is we have three different types. And these three different types are basically designated as, number one, no characteristics are visible with or without magnification. Now when you look at this stone, it looks clean. You can't see anything in it to your naked eye. If you were to pick up a magnifying instrument, like a loop, a jeweler's loop, which is a 10 power magnification, if you looked at this stone with a loop, you probably will, still wouldn't see anything in it. Absolutely, we call that clean and definitely eye clean. So <clears throat> that would be a type one. Now a type two, you might look at it and say, I can't see anything in it with my naked eye. But the minute we pick up a loop, and start looking with the magnification, suddenly you see things inside. Then we have a type three. With or without magnification, I can see things happening inside this material. So those are our three designations, and they make a big difference, but we have to be careful never to compare a type one with a type three. Because if my chart were that simple, and if this was something so simple that everybody could do, well, think of it this way. If we're looking at a diamond, we know that diamonds go from flawless, internally flawless. Then we go VVS1, VVS2, which is very, very slightly included. Then we have VS1, VS2, very slightly included. And then we have SI1, SI2, slightly included, followed by I1, I2, and I3, which is included 1, 2, and 3. Not imperfect in any way because I, on that scale, it's still considered gem quality scale. We don't get um, industrial quality until it goes beyond I3. So in a diamond, your diamond could fall anywhere from completely flawless with nothing in it, all the way down to something that looks like this. And therefore, we use that scale for diamond, and we judge all diamonds against it, and that's not a problem. But Let's say I have this beautiful stone and it is always clean. It's going to get a 10 out of 10 because it's always has nothing in it. That's, it's going to get the highest mark. This one is only going to get a 2 out of 10 or a 3 out of 10. But we all know how valuable emeralds are, how expensive emeralds are, right? So when you're looking at clarity and comparing, you can't say, oh, I'm only going to give this a 2 out of 10, and I'm going to give that a 10 out of 10, because it wouldn't seem completely right. So what we do, we have these which even out that playing field, and then we can you know, judge them a little bit more evenly, which is important. OK, so here we have 
all the different ones that are on type one, now I say all. There are 5,000 mineral species available. We can't put all of them on here for you, but the majority of them you wouldn't know. So if we're looking just at gems, and if we're looking at the gems that you might know, then this is a list of type one gems. So all of these we would expect not to see anything in them. So if I'm going to buy an aquamarine, or if I'm going to buy a topaz, I should be prepared that I'm not going to see anything in that stone. Because if somebody shows me an aquamarine or a topaz, it's full of inclusions, then what does that tell me? That tells me it's a very low grade material. It's not a high grade, it's a low grade. So in that, in that uh, way, we actually know whether they're giving us something that is more valuable or less valuable. We understand the, we have to understand the clarity a little bit better. So these are things like aquamarine, morganite. Morganite's getting very popular right now. Morganite is a type of beryl. Heliodore is a type of beryl as well. So these come with the same family as emerald. And even though they're the same family, meaning they have the same chemical composition and crystal structure as emerald, these two usually are a type one, whereas emerald is a type three. So even within one family, within one species, you can have them coming with different types. We've also got crystal beryl, which is usually this nice yellow color. We have kunzite, which is a lovely pink. We've got green tourmalines. Of course, they come in all shades of green, many, many different shades. We've got the smoky quartz. We've got the imperial topaz and blue topaz. And then, of course, we've got our blue zircon, white zircon. Now, zircon is not synthetic cubic zirconia. This is natural material right here. Natural gems that have been known for centuries. They're in the breastplate of Aaron. Zircon is the birthstone for December. So please don't confuse these with synthetic cubic zirconia, which is man-made material made in the 1970s. And lastly, tanzanite which is very popular now, and uh, also now the birthstone for December, by the way, because since 2005, they decided to give this uh, a birthstone for December. Okay, so let's take a look at some type twos. An Alexandrite chrysoberyl. This is a gem which changes color. It is known for in daylight to look green like an emerald, and in incandescent lighting, which is the yellowish light, to look red like a ruby. And these are very special and in large size and with a good color change, they can be exceptionally expensive, even if they have inclusions. Why? Because we would expect to see inclusions in these using our loop. We might not see them with our naked eye, but I wouldn't be surprised and I wouldn't be upset if I saw inclusions in uh, these materials with the loop. So corundum, this is all corundum. Remember that corundum is basically ruby and sapphire. Sapphires come in every color you can imagine. Ruby is red, but all the others would be the same family members within the corundum family. Then we have garnets and also spinel. Garnets and spinel are two different minerals and they would be a type two. I would expect to see something with my loop in these materials. We've got iolite, which looks like blue sapphire, but it's a different chemical composition and crystal structure. We have peridot, that's a popular one, birthstone for August, some people really love it. They're getting very expensive now. We have quartz, which could be amethyst or citrine, which is yellow, or ametrine, which is both colors. We also have tourmaline, they come in lots of colors. You've seen the green ones were in the type one. Well, all of these colors, are in type two, the pinks, the oranges, etc. The greens, reds, pinks, and uh, watermelon are in a type three. And then we've got zircon of this color or any other color that's not blue and white. And lastly, we've got our type three. Emerald is the primary one that most people know. We also have red beryl. Sorry, this is the red beryl right here. And the red beryl looks like a ruby. In fact, it even looks the same as this one. They can be very misleading. The difference is different chemical composition and crystal structures, which we can't see. So these two are from the same family, emerald and red beryl. They're both from beryl. This one here is a tourmaline, and that's called rubellite. 
So rubellite has got nothing to do with ruby. It's not the same material. It's a completely different chemical composition and crystal structure. Then we also have um, watermelon tourmalin right here. This is the pink tourmalin, and these tend to be these tend to be included. So if somebody comes and shows me a red beryl that is totally clean, either I have something of great value there, or I might have a synthetic, or who knows what it is, but it's not normal for these gems to have nothing in them when I look with my loop. It's really not normal, all right? So that's the way we, we work with this. You know, I've had people, especially here in Asia, come to me with big gems that look like a ruby, beautiful red color, the violetish red, best color for ruby. And they say to me, oh, this is my grandmother's ruby. My grandmother left it to me. Now, first thing I would do is I go, first of all, it looks impressive because such a big size and such good color, wow. Then I would take my loop out and I would have a look with my loop to see what I can see. If I see inclusions, then I wouldn't be very suspicious. But if I see nothing inside that gemstone, nothing at all, then I would be very suspicious that it's probably a synthetic ruby. And I would suggest that they go to a lab and have it properly tested. And the reaction to that that I usually get is somebody says, oh no, this is my grandmother's ruby. It couldn't be synthetic because, you know, my grandmother's quite old already. Okay, guess what? <laughs> They've been making synthetic rubies since the late 1700s, early 1800s. So unless your grandmother was older than that, then the chances are, yes, maybe it's a synthetic. It's possible. There's a lot, especially in this part of the, the, uh, the world, there's a lot of them. So make use of that. You know, that's something that we can just really understand a little bit to, uh, to clarify. So coming now to how important inclusions are. Some people like to call them imperfections or flaws. Anything they find inside a gem, they like to call it an imperfection, a flaw. Gemologically speaking, we do not use these words. They are not in our vocabulary. Why are they not in our vocabulary? Because today, there's so many synthetics on the market. You see now we've even got synthetic diamonds, which are the hardest ones to produce. But there's so many of them on the market that sometimes the only way we can tell whether it's natural or synthetic is by looking at the inclusions. Because inclusions, they're called inclusions because they're inside, but inclusions in natural material have taken millions of years to form. The inclusions in synthetic material is formed in three months, six months, very, very much faster. They're not going to look the same. They are going to have differences. But this is not an easy thing to just look at one and, oh, now I know what it looks like. There's no now I know what it looks like because every gem is unique. Like you and I, we're all people, but we all look slightly different. And it's the same with the inclusions inside a gem. Every inclusion is like a fingerprint. We have our own fingerprints. They have their fingerprints. Yeah. So it's not quite that easy. And distinguishing between the uh, natural and the synthetic is, is tough to do. You need a lot of experience. You need a lot of skill. You need to look at hundreds of natural ones and hundreds of synthetic ones to really know the difference. So. Inclusions is basically anything that's trapped inside a mineral while that mineral formed. And it could be anything. There could be what we call included crystals. So that would be another little mineral inside, which is a completely different nature to the host. It could be that it's a liquid. That's also very possible. Maybe sometimes liquids get trapped in the formation process. Or it could even be a fracture that occurs due to you know, changes in the environment when that mineral is growing. Because you think about the, they're in the earth for millions of years. We're going to have lots of you know, moments when it stops, when it changes, when it gets hotter, when it gets cooler. So there's a lot of changes that occur. 
And we find new mineral species with all kinds of exciting inclusions uh, quite frequently. Do you know that every year we, we discover about 80 new species of gems? 80 new species every year. Wow, that's exciting. How come you never get to hear about them? How come nobody ever tells you about them? Why didn't your jeweler tell you about all these new ones that are coming out? Because somebody's got to promote them. Who's promoting them? All the new stuff, nobody knows how valuable it's going to be. Maybe it's going to be extremely rare like the Paraiba tourmaline, or maybe it's going to be something that we're going to find in great quantities and then it's not going to be much value. So nobody is willing to put that effort into advertising and promoting it until we really know a bit more about it. So that's why you don't get to hear about lots of them. Yeah. We have some questions for you. Sure. Related to that is, one is, in what way can various treatments affect the variety of the gem? Uh, there's a lot of ways treatments can, uh, you know, there are so many treatments nowadays. Uh, the tr so did everybody hear the question? Um, the question was, how do treatments affect the clarity of a gem, right? So let's just take one of the very standard treatments. I can't go over all of them because it would, be, it would take too long. But let's say heat treatment as one, right? When we heat up a gem, it can do so many different things. It can lighten its color. It can darken its color. Uh, it can cause it to change color. And it can also cause other inclusions to occur within the material. So you could have a transparent material that when you heat treat it, it develops silk, which are the little uh, needles that are found inside. And because it has so many of those needles, it becomes more and more opaque. And it might even be able to produce asterism, which is a phenomena. So that's just one example of how a treatment can cause uh, a difference in opacity in the gem and a difference in the look of the gem. Yeah. And one more question. I'm not sure if it's more relevant later. Maybe we need to ask each side of clarity more important in the value of time. Sorry, is what or clarity? Each side of clarity more important. Size or clarity. So yes. I'm I'd like to answer that, Madeline, a little bit later because we're going to get into size. We're going to talk about the weight, the carat weight of gems. So if we can do that at the end, just remind me, we'll do it at the end. Good. Okay, so we were talking about internal characteristics, inclusions, and we have different types of inclusions. We have the protogenetic inclusions. Now those are basically already present before the mineral formed, and when the mineral started to form, it just grew around, and it encompassed those inclusions within. So it's, it's just existing minerals that end up being inside the new mineral. So that means that the host mineral grew later and that the other inclusions are older than the host mineral. So these are rutile needles. Now rutile needles are another mineral. And these are in essence gold rutile needles which are very pretty because they're gold in color. But rutile is a mineral that can come in a lot of different colors. So it can produce black needles, it can produce pink needles, green needles, silver color needles. And because these are gold, and because people like gold, then the gold ones usually end up commanding a higher price than say black, which is not everybody's favorite color, because it's not a color. So anyhow, these needles are formed before the actual crystal, and then the crystal forms around it. Then we have others which are syngenetic uh, inclusions. So these are formed at the same time. Now what happens is a, a mineral can grow, and as it's getting along very nicely growing in the earth, then there can be a change, some kind of change. Maybe there's a shift in the earth, maybe the temperature changes, or maybe the nutrients change. So it might stop growing for a while until suddenly those uh, the shift comes back, and then the environment comes back into what it was previously, and then it will start to grow up again. So every time it stops, and then starts, and stops, and starts, and stops, you end up seeing what look like ghosts, little kind of, they call them phantom crystals, where you have what looks like a ghost-like um, 
a structure within the material. So it's just solids, liquids, or gases that get trapped in between those different stages. And because of the crystal structure of that material, it is going to look like the same shape within the shape itself as it continues to grow throughout. So a lot of people look for these and love the idea that they are phantoms. Um, but that's all it is. It's just inclusions within the material that are causing that effect. And then we have epigenetic inclusions. These are basically happening after the growth of the crystal. And this could be that the crystal cracks in some way, shape, or form. And it could have cracked way in the earth under pressure or something like that. And when it's in its environment, it's possible that in the crack, you can get the nutrients to go to flow back into the crack. It can actually, if it's there long enough, it can, um, it can regenerate. It can cause the crack to disappear if those nutrients go in and what we call heal the crack. So that's also a possibility. But sometimes the cracks might get filled with liquids, which will cause a very nice iridescence. And again, this is something a lot of people look for because it's a unique phenomena. It's something that not all gems are going to have. And the colors, the way you see the colors is also very exciting and very interesting. So a lot of these end up being collector's items that people will uh, pick up and enjoy. These like rainbows. It's just diffraction of light due to maybe the liquid that is within a fracture inside the material. So we do have a lot of challenges when we are talking about clarity. Um, we said that if you're looking with a loop, it's great that you have a loop. A loop is 10 times usually. That's what we use as the industry standard. But some inclusions are going to be very small. And if the inclusions are very small and you can't really see them properly, then you can't really call it, right? You might say, oh, are these natural inclusions or are they synthetic inclusions, right? If you look at that, you look at how kind of very soft and round that shape is. That's not normally a natural looking inclusion because if you have inclusions in crystalline material, they tend to be with a crystal structure and they tend to be very angular. So when we see something very kind of rounded, then we get suspicious and we think, okay, that could be a gas bubble. And gas bubbles are not found in natural material. But this is the caveat here. We have to be careful because people love to look at something, they see a dot, and then they scream, gas bubble. And they say, this is not a natural gem. It's a, it's a synthetic. We can't do that. We have to really see it before we call it. So maybe we don't have enough magnification to see it. We don't all have the luxury of having the microscopes. So um, if we just use magnification, this is not the only way to distinguish what a gemstone is. The first thing to do before you even go to magnification is to actually find out what the material is. And that is done by using other pieces of equipment and finding out the properties of the gems long before you go to just looking at the inclusions. So the inclusions, looking at inclusions, basing something on inclusion, we'd have to know what it is before we actually base uh, uh, something on an inclusion. Because then we would know what types of inclusions we're likely to find in that material. Otherwise, it wouldn't be smart. So definitely, magnification alone is not a way to identify something. It might help to say, oh, it doesn't look natural, or it does. But it's not the only way to do it. So um, we need to really understand by not just looking at the materials, and lots of materials. I said you have to look at hundreds of natural inclusions and hundreds of synthetic inclusions to know what the difference is. Because every one of those is going to be different, even from stone to stone. People love to say, oh, we can look at a picture. I know what a gas bubble is because I've seen a picture of a gas bubble. But a gas bubble in one gem might look very different from a gas bubble in another gem. It could be a different shape. It could be totally different. So. There isn't a way to just look at pictures in a book and go, this looks like this, therefore it is that. It doesn't work that way. 
It's very, very far from it, in fact. So it requires a great deal of practice. Uh, and that's why we need our labs today. And we need the people who do it every single day, who know what they're doing, to really look at it, to understand it. OK, let's take a look at some natural inclusions now. Um, we said included crystals. These are included crystals. And if you look at the shape of these things, of course, this is at high magnification, looking inside the gem. But you look, they're very angular. They are very straight looking edges. They're not soft and round, and they are very angular. So this is typical of what uh, we see in a lot of natural gems. Now, there are some exceptions. When they make synthetic, um, synthetic materials, sometimes we get, for example, um, hematite platelets. But hematite platelets would mean that it might be a natural host. But platinum platelets means that it's a synthetic. So little bits of platinum that do come out looking very angular. Look how angular that looks. So you can't just say, oh, blanket, angular, must be natural, uh, rounded, must be synthetic. It doesn't actually work that way, although a lot of people would like to think it does. And sometimes you have so much happening. How are we going to tell from this? There are so many inclusions in this one. So fingerprints are another one that are very interesting to look at. And we call them fingerprints because they're like our fingerprints. They're very unusual. Each one of us has a different fingerprint. Well, every gem will have a fingerprint specific to, to itself. And these fingerprints can be all kinds of things, including liquids and gases and things of that nature. And so typically, scars can form. As we said, you could have fractures and stuff. And then those fractures can uh, absorb nutrients. And when they have nutrients that fill in the fractures, they don't always fill in the fractures evenly. So that's where you might get these kind of very interesting looking patterns, etc. So we also have fingerprints in synthetic material. Now I've given you a very simple one. This is the natural looking fingerprint. This is a synthetic looking fingerprint. If you were to look at this for the first time, you might think that that looks natural. It does have some kind of angular areas to it, which is very true. But it's much more opaque. It's much coarser, globby looking. This, these are definitely synthetic inclusions. Again, how would you know? You wouldn't know if you hadn't seen them, if you hadn't seen lots of them, and if you hadn't seen lots of natural ones as well. So it's just a question of really having a look at so many. Here we can see that um, hydrothermal grown synthetics have liquid and gas-filled fingerprints just like their natural counterparts. So what does that mean? OK, when I started to study back in the 1980s, you could say, in those days, when we looked with our microscopes, if you saw a three-phase inclusion, that means that you have a gas, a liquid, and a solid. And if you found those three things together in an emerald, it's probably a Colombian emerald. And if you found those three things, it would be natural origin. And that, on the certificate, they would say that's proof of natural because we have the three items together. Today, that doesn't work anymore. No, nope. technology has improved. The hydrothermal method is one of the best methods, which means that they know the temperature, they know um, the chemical composition, the crystal structure. They know everything they need to know and how much heat is necessary. What they're doing is they're recreating the same environment. And with that same environment, they are able to recreate what Mother Nature makes exactly. So as scary as that sounds, yes, this is why we need the labs. The labs have multi-million dollar equipment. Multi-million dollar equipment can, can distinguish. But just a person looking at a different looking inclusion every time, that doesn't help. Yeah. So all kinds of things. We've got flux. We've also got um, 
Uh, other than hydrothermal, we've also got uh, flame fusion methods. So there's a lot of methods today by which they make the gems. And so you will find lots of very interesting things in them. So fractures also tend to look uh, very similar to fingerprints. And in diamonds, we have things that are called feathers, which are also, it's breakage along the cleavage plane. Right, when you have a gem material, it can have the atoms not quite so tightly bonded in one direction as they are in another direction, more tightly bonded. And so when you hit it in a particular direction, you can cause a fracture to run straight through the material. And that is called a feather. So that can happen in colored stones, but it's most normally found in diamonds. Let's have a look at some corundum. Now, these are inclusions that are found both in ruby and sapphire. And do you see the lines running through? These are very fine lines. We call them silk. And this is what causes asterism. So when we get a star ruby or a star sapphire, the reason we get the star appearing on the surface when we put a light on it is because the light is reflecting off these little teeny tiny inclusions. Do you think you can see these? You can't see these with 10 power magnification. This is with 80 power microscope. You can only see them when you go up to a much, much higher power. So typically on ruby and sapphire, they're going to be in a very specific orientation, which is at 60 or 120 degrees to one another. And that's because of the way that that crystal grows. It has that hexagonal kind of pattern within it. And the more of these that are in the material, the more likely you are to get the star or the asterism in the material. And there we can see the star stones. Star sapphire. This is a black star sapphire in the center and a star ruby. Now, sometimes the star is very visible. It means that we probably have more of those inside that the light's reflecting better off them. And sometimes we have a few and they're not very well placed and you might not even get a full star or you might not see the star very clearly. So it depends very much on those inclusions to get the star. And of course, this is valuable material. Why is this valuable material? Why are star stones quite valuable? If you have a star stone, good color and good phenomena, it can be very valuable. Why? Because it is more rare. Not all rubies are gonna have stars. Not all sapphires are going to have stars. So that makes it special because it can do something that others can't do. All right, spinel. Now, this is an inclusion. I know spinel is a gemstone, but spinel can also very often be an inclusion in another mineral. And as you see here, that's what it is. It's an inclusion. And how do we know that's a spinel? Well, with multi-million dollar equipment, we can actually analyze what it is. But this is also the typical shape of a spinel, which is an octahedron. Octahedron means it has eight sides to it. And this is the same shape in which diamond grows in the earth. It grows in that form, interestingly. So sometimes you can get diamond octahedron trapped inside a mineral, and sometimes you can get spinel trapped inside. It could be any mineral trapped within another mineral. So these are special inclusions. And normally when these are found, they don't just go to the jeweler and they end up being sold to anyone. A lot of collectors look for these. A lot of dealers, people who are in our industry, they look for these. Because these are really interesting inclusions. Not all of them are going to have such lovely, you know, especially if they're nice shape, not all of them will have them. So, Garnet. Now, garnet is a very nice gem, and this one is a demantoid garnet, and that usually has a very interesting inclusion, which is called the horsetail inclusion. If you think of a horse running and the tail splaying out like that, that's what we get in this particular very vibrant green material, which is very, very nice. So um, the horsetail is usually gold in color, which also can look a little bit like our rutile needles, but it's, it's not, it's not. And basically this is, and it was, 
a um, proof that it was a Dementoid garnet. Again, years ago we would say that's proof. Today we wouldn't say it's proof anymore. Unfortunately, we do find other materials and other things that now have these in them. So it's no longer proof of Dementoid, but it's a strong indication if you do find it. So again, we'd still have to go and get things checked. This is one that intrigues me. It's the Moonstone. Moonstone is a type three, meaning that it's typically very highly included. And inside the Moonstone, there's a lot of cleavage. Cleavage means that it breaks in different directions and you can see the breaks. So this is one direction of break as it comes down this way. And then this is another direction of break this way. You see that one's coming out as well. So it breaks in those directions typically. So what happens is that this looks like a centipede. And so Moonstone, if you find good centipedes in the Moonstone, it's kind of cool to have little centipedes which look like they're inside. Of course, they're not, they're just cracks, but they're fractures that run in that direction because of the cleavage of the material. And Peridot, very popular gem, has lily pads. So this is a lily pad. Remember, the gem is much bigger. We're focusing in on the inclusion here and it looks kind of oval in shape and it looks like it has a center with some little things coming out of it. it looks like a lily pad. So when you have peridots, it's very typical to find these lily pad inclusions. All right, it says here, so unique that it is usually proof of peridot without needing further testing. So in this particular case, that stands up until today. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. We'll see what happens in the future because we are in, you know, we're finding so many new things and so many new things are happening that everything changes. Nothing really stays the same, unfortunately. Now, if we talk about a gas bubble, I want to talk about the gas bubble for a moment because a lot of people have heard about gas bubbles and don't quite know what they look like. They are typically round, although they don't have to be. They can be any shape. They could be a drop shape. They could be a funny shape. But what you see with a gas bubble, you see an outline and then you see an internal shape which follows the outline. So whatever the outline, if it's a drop outline, you're going to have an internal shape following that drop outline. If you have a, an outline like this, inside it's going to have an outline like this. And so you see a reflection of the outline within the piece normally. That's not what you see with an included crystal. So when we talk about gas bubbles, all right, they are usually found in man-made materials. Right, there are, of course, there's always an exception. The exception here is natural glass. And there is another exception, which is amber. Amber is an organic material. It's not a mineral, but we'll just mention it. So typically, the gas bubbles are never alone in natural crystal other than in natural glass. All right, so if you're going to see this, then if you're going to see it, it's probably you need a lot of magnification to see a gas bubble in a natural material because it's going to be very small and it's going to be like the emerald we saw earlier, the gas bubble with a liquid, with a gas together, but not visible with the loop, only visible with the microscope. So if you can see something big like this, and if you can see it with your naked eye, or if you can see it with your loop, then you need to be careful because there's a high chance that it's either uh, man-made glass, it could be natural glass or man-made glass, it could be plastic, could be synthetic, or it could even be an assembled gem where we take pieces and we combine them together as an assembled gem. So we've got doublets and triplets on the market. The gas bubbles, they tend to, when you stick two pieces together, they tend to get trapped between the layers. So what you do there is you look and see are all the gas bubbles on the same plane. Again, you can't do that by looking with your loop. You have to do it by looking with a microscope. It's the only way to do it. So we have to be wary of this. Now, um, they can just be really difficult to distinguish. Again, you need practice to distinguish them. This one really looks like a gas bubble. It's got that internal and the external. It's quite clear. This one is really tiny. If I can't see it properly, then I can't call it. 
I'm going to have to go to a microscope and go even higher. And if that was under a microscope, then I still can't make that determination. All right. Here, that looks very much like an outline within a. So what happens here is that we've got different lightings happening. So with different lightings, you're also going to see different uh, results. So that's another thing to, to be aware of. So they can be very small, difficult to clearly see. Um, if they're separated, right? If they're one gas bubble, then it could be that it's a gas bubble. But if there's a lot of them, and if they're within a certain, like a fingerprint, then there's a, a chance that that's not gas bubbles. So you just have to be careful and look closely and see that they don't have geometric shapes. If they don't have geometric shapes, then that might be. But high magnification is very, very important there. All right. So look at these. This is the emerald, the Colombian emerald. And here you see a liquid. You see a gas bubble. And you see a solid. That's how what we call a three-phase inclusion. When they come together like that, that's in natural material. But that is under 80 to 100 power. That's not something you're going to see with your loop ever. Yeah. All right. Now, inclusions that add value, well, rutile needles. You will find that if the rutile needles are golden, they're very pretty. A lot of people like them. And a lot of people pay extra to have lots of beautiful rutile. And they're typically found in quartz and in tourmalines as well. So that's one that's very popular. What about, we did mention amber, which is not a mineral, but it's an organic material. But when you get different types of I insects in the amber, those can also add value to your amber. A very clear piece of amber with nothing in it. Again, how do you know it's not a piece of plastic? Could be a piece of plastic. So if we see something, now that doesn't mean, oh, I see a bug, therefore it's a piece of amber. No, then we have to look at the bug more closely. We got to see is that, does that look like the bug was trapped? Because if you look at some of the bugs in amber, here, if you look at the face of, of this one or the eyes of that one, you will see the eyes are still exactly the same as the day it was trapped. Now, I have a piece of plastic that is imitation amber with a snake in it. And that snake is all coiled up. And if you took a look with your loop, you will see the eyes are completely dried and sunken. So dried, sunken eyes, there's no way that that got trapped. That was something that maybe died, and it dried up. And then someone thought, oh, this is a good idea. Let's put it in some plastic and sell it as a piece of amber. Right? So those are the kind of things that you kind of need to look for. And again, it's not that easy. You do need to um, have some help looking at it. Uh, even opaque materials can have inclusions. So this is lapis lazuli, lazuli. It has pyrite mineral mixed with it. And when you have the pyrite, the pyrite raises the value of the lapis. The more pyrite you have, the better quality it is. You know, people like to call it gold. It's not gold, it's pyrite. Pyrite is another mineral. But it looks like gold sometimes. So people say, oh, the more gold, the more valuable. No, it's the more pyrite, the more valuable it is. If you had calcite mixed with that, which is a white mineral, then it would drop in value. Why? Because it's less blue. The more white it is, the less valuable it is. Um, just notice here that, sorry, why did my thing? Just notice that imitation lapis is also made today, even with little bits that look like indistinguishable. Again, we have to go to a lab and get the lab to look at it with the microscope. So uh, hopefully that gave you a few ideas for, yeah. Before you go, Clarity. Sorry. Just before you go on to the considerations in carrot weight, uh, we had a couple of good questions that were um, brought up. Okay. I'm not sure whether you already covered Maybelline's question yes. about uh, size or clarity. We said we're coming important. back to it. We're going to do so Maybelline's this one's coming up shortly. This, yeah. Okay. Um, and Victoria had a question to say, gemstones with inclusions are unique and beautiful, but do they have the same durability and wearability as gemstones that have no inclusions? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, that's for Victoria, right? So yeah. um, let's take an emerald as an example. An emerald is a good wearable gem. Um, if you look at it on a hardness scale, it's a seven and a half 
out of 10, whereas diamond is 10. Of course, nothing beats diamond for hardness. But we have to remember, hardness is only resistance to scratching. So there is another, but it's not a scale, but there is another thing we talk about in gems is toughness. Now, diamonds are actually not the toughest gemstone we have. In fact, um, diamond, if you took a diamond in one hand and you took a piece of jade in the other hand and you smashed it together really hard, the one to break first would be diamond, surprisingly, because the toughness of diamond is not as good as jade. When diamond breaks, it breaks because the crystal structure, there is cleavage. So you could give it a knock. If you knock it in the direction where those atoms are less um, bonded together, it'll just whoosh, go straight through very quickly. Whereas jade is extremely tough. Jade is one of the toughest, which is why we all like to wear the bangle bracelets and we say, oh, the bangle is very protective in jade. Yes, because of its toughness. That's exactly why. Um, so when it comes to inclusions, any inclusions that are like fractures could give a, a durability problem. And uh, we do need to be more careful with gems that have lots of fractures. If it's other types of inclusions, like included crystals, those aren't going anywhere. They're not going to get bigger. They're not going to get smaller. Those are things that just got engulfed when the thing grew or could be that they were produced at the same time as we saw, but those are not going to go anywhere. So the, the dangerous ones are going to be the fractures, and especially fractures that break the surface of the material. Those would cause uh, durability problems. So yes, we would have to be a little bit more careful. Thank you. Great. OK, now we come to Maybelline's question about the size as well, because we're going to add size into the mix here. We're going to talk about carat weight. And all gems are um, weighed per carat. And when we sell gems, generally we're selling them per carat. That's a normal standard procedure. Um, sometimes somebody might sell you a gem and say that's the price for the gem. It is possible. But in general, it's a per carat price that we're looking for. Um, with diamonds and colored gems, there are differences. We talked about that a little bit earlier. We said all diamonds can be judged on one scale for clarity. We would be more careful with uh, clarity for colored stones because they come in different types, right? But when it comes for carat weight, we also have differences because diamond is one material and it has one specific gravity. And no matter whether it's a colored diamond or whether it's a colorless diamond, the specific gravity is 3.52 and that's it. But with colored stones, because they're all different densities, then we can't just guess. It wouldn't be easy to guess, and it wouldn't be right to guess what the. So we have to use charts. And we do have charts that we can go to to be able to estimate the weight. And you might say, but well, why do we want to estimate the weight of something? Well, if I was a designer and I'm creating a beautiful uh, piece of jewelry for you to buy, you might ask me, how many carats of diamonds do I have, or how many carats of of, of the gem is there. And I would need to give you an answer to that. So I would have to go to a chart. If I didn't have the gemstone in hand and I couldn't weigh it, I would have to go to a chart and I would have to work out an estimate. And specific gravity, absolutely different in every gem. Now, here's an example. Um, we said that what happens typically is that if a gem increases in size, we do know that most gems, as the size increases, the price goes up. I mean, you look at a diamond, for sure, for sure, the bigger it gets, the price is going up. It's an exponential curve. But there are some minerals that the larger it gets, it will go beyond what we would normally want to wear. I have a 50 carat topaz, a beautiful stone, this big. What can I do with this stone? It's beautiful. I could probably wear it as a pendant. Fantastic. Now, I'm a bit short, so it's big for me. A lot of people my height might say, mm, it's too big. I want something a little bit smaller. All right? Could I wear it as an earring? Way too heavy, right? It's going to cause my earlobes to 
become very long. So could I wear it as a bracelet or a ring? I couldn't possibly wear it as either a bracelet or a ring because it's on an extremity. It's going to get knocked to high heaven. It's going to get scratched all over the place. So I, I wouldn't be able to wear it that way. So what other brooch? If it's 50 carats and then I add the gold to it, my goodness, that's going to be heavy on my material. So I'd have to have pretty heavy material if I'm going to wear it. So do you see how limited we are? So it's, it's OK to say the bigger the thing gets, the more valuable it is to a point. All right? With diamonds, they're so rare that, of course, the price is always going to be the bigger it is, the, the higher it's going to be. But colored stones, topaz, Quartz, quartz is the dust of the earth. When it gets to a certain point, it's going to suddenly go like this. So when we look at this chart, you can see here. Yes. This is the chart for, for quartz, right? Yes. Could you explain why you said that for diamond it goes up exponentially? Because this is a linear increase. OK. Why is it that diamond gets exponentially more Diamond valuable? gets exponentially more because the bigger the diamond, the more rare it's going to be. And the fact that rarity is something that, that plays into its value. Um, it's very unlikely that you're going to find a 50 carat diamond. I mean, yes, there's one or two in the world, but you know, you're not going to find that many. How many 50 carat topaz can we find? Lots. How many 50 carat quartz can we find? Lots. In fact, we get quartz and, and topaz in such big sizes that um, it's just a different, a very different material, all right? And a lot of people say, well, instead of making it 50, cut it down, make it 30. Have two stones, 130 and 120. OK, it doesn't work like that. The more I cut it, the more waste I get. Every time I cut something, I'm going to get 50 to 60% waste. So I'm going to just lose a lot more of the value that I could otherwise gain. So definitely, we won't, wouldn't want to do that. All right, so this is what happens with the carat weight on something that's just too big uh, to wear or too uncomfortable to wear. So if we look at diamonds in particular, right, you could actually look at a chart like this and you could say if it's a one carat, it's going to be about 6.5 across. So when you look at this measurement here from here to here, that's 6.5 millimeters. That's approximately one carat. Every one carat is about that size. And when you say, oh, but are you sure this for every one carat? OK, today, diamonds are very precisely cut. Diamonds are more precisely cut than any other gemstone. And why are they so precisely cut? Because they're usually colorless. So what do they offer us? if they're colorless, if there's no color. The only thing they offer is how they react with light, that brilliance, that dispersion. And if they're not cut properly within certain angles and certain proportions, then we are not going to see the brilliance and dispersion is not going to be a beautiful stone. So I can tell you for sure, for sure, pretty much every one carat diamond, if it is well cut, is going to be 6.5 millimeters in size. And if you look up here, you'll see the four carats that is about 10.3 millimeters across. That's very standard for a four carat round, of course. Um, so one question I have on this one, just an interesting fact thing. If you look at um, the one carat and now look at the four carat, does the four carat look four times bigger? And yet it's four times heavier. So that means that we've got four times, we've got more weight on the bottom, right? The pavilion is very thick, and that is what makes it heavier. So is it a great idea to have uh, a four carat stone? What's the price of a four carat? <sighs> price is very high. It's much more than four times this. So we've got a lot of jewelers today that are doing interesting things by taking four one carats and putting them close together and getting really what looks like four times bigger, but not the price of a four carat, much less than the price of a four carat. So if you look out for that, you'll see there's a lot of very interesting designs now that work on that principle. But we can pretty much guess the weight of a diamond. Now here you will see the other gems. We've got uh, lots of different types of gems here, every one of them having a different specific gravity. So unless we have a chart 
And unless we work with the chart, we are not going to be able to estimate the weight of the color stones. We are going to have to either have it in hand and weigh it properly on a proper scale, um, or we're not going to know what the uh, estimated weight is because it's difficult to assess. So we had a question that was, uh, are there any practical tips to help you estimate the weight of a gemstone? Now, obviously, for the well, diamond, you gave yes. us a practical tip. Yeah. If it's a round diamond and it's well cut, you know from, right. from there. Unfortunately, but are there any tips that you can give us for colored gemstones? Th there really isn't because there's too many of them and they've all got different specific gravities. So what happens is if I take a, um, let's say, a 6.5 diamond and I put it next to an exactly the same cut and shape 6.5 millimeter ruby, right? The diamond will be one carat, the ruby will be 1.12. It's going to be heavier because the specific gravity of ruby is 4 instead of 3.52. So, I mean, there is no equation that you can kind of do unless you have the charts. You need charts. So if you've got the charts, then you can work it out that way. But there isn't really another uh, tip that will be helpful. In, and in fact, the tip is don't do it. Yes, the tip is don't do it. Uh, <laughs> the, the tip is don't do it. Another reason for that is... is you've got all different shapes as different well. Different shapes and also with colored gemstones, the yeah. cut of colored gemstones, can be it's deeper. not got a straight base. It's not got a V-shaped um, pavilion. They have a, a, a sort of... I they can, they can be they have more... A, yeah. So colored gems, you know, at the end of the day, they want to maximize the beauty of that color. And if they have to make it deeper to get more color, they'll do it. If it's too dark, they might make it shallower to make it less dark, right? So they're going to, you know, explore how they can get the best color from it. And that's so different from a diamond. So really, there is no guessing. There is only weigh it or go to charts and try to work it out from a chart. But hopefully, if you do buy a gem, you're somewhere where you can actually weigh it or you're somewhere where somebody can, you know, somebody who knows that gem, knows what it was, maybe before it was set, somewhere they've got some information and they'll be able to tell you the accurate carat weight of the gem. Now we can go to Madeline's question, which was? Oh, gosh. Sorry, I forgot what the question was. Uh, Maybelline said, is size or clarity more important in diamonds? Is size or clarity more important in diamonds? Okay, I think I would say size is more important. And um, the reason for that is that um, if you're looking at clarity, flawless internally, flawless VVS1, VVS2, and VS1, Honestly, you can't see a difference if you're just looking at the stone. You would have to have magnification to see the differences, and you'd really have to work hard at the top end to see a difference there. So we can compromise a lot with um, the clarity. And especially if you have a colored diamond, when it comes to colored diamonds, we don't mind if colored diamonds have inclusions in them. Why? Because they are the rarest of all diamonds. Today, we have fewer natural diamonds existing than we have Pablo Picasso paintings. So one artist was able to produce in his lifetime more paintings than we have been able to extract natural color diamonds. So when it comes to that, we're, we're okay with inclusions in colored diamonds. We're not, that's not such a big issue. Also because the color can sometimes mask those inclusions, which is good. But the colorless ones, it doesn't mask it so well. So I think still I would go with, with size. I think that would be more important than clarity. I'd compromise on clarity. Thank you. All right. So in conclusion, uh, with clarity, it's a huge topic. There's just so much to know and understand. It's not something you can come, now we know about clarity. Now we can go out and look at clarity. Not quite. Um, you still need to rely on the person that's selling to you. You need to rely on somebody who's knowledgeable, who is producing, presenting your stone to you, uh, ask them questions about the clarity and find out as much as you can about it. But it's not easy. Carrot weight, it's a little bit easier, but you still have to have somebody who's going to weigh it for you or you need to, you can't guess, never guess the weight of the gem. So both of them, very interesting topics. 
lots to learn and um, going forward. I just hope that this has enlightened you a little bit in those two areas. And I think we'd like to open the floor to questions, if you have questions. Yes? Um, this current day is used, we normally talk about modern night in comparison to diamond because of the cut. So um, where does this fall under which category? Okay, when you talk about moissanite, it's actually synthetic moissanite, which is a man-made material. So as a man-made material today, they can actually produce any clarity in the man-made material. So as you see, even synthetic diamonds, we can have different clarities. We can have an SI, we can have a VBS, we can have whatever clarity you want. They can, they can actually produce different clarities today. Um, but usually, synthetic moissanite is quite clean. It's, it's a type one. It's very, good, very unlikely that you will see um, inclusions with or without a loop. Um, but it is a, a man-made material. So I guess I'm not sure what the question is. So it doesn't fall into any of these categories other than natural because it's man-made. Right? It is a man-made material. What about for asterism for rose quartz? Asterism for I, I rose quartz? You only go through uh, Yeah, so, so rose quartz um, does have asterism. And again, what are you going to look for? You're going to look for a uh, couple of things. You can look for the color. It should be a very nice, strong pink color. And you're going to look at the star. Is it a very sharp, crisp, and vibrant star? Can you see the star really well? If you can see it really well, then that is more valuable. If it's a kind of weak, wishy-washy star, if the pink is kind of weak and you can't really see the, the pink in it, um, again, is it more opaque? I have a couple of star uh, rose quartz that are completely transparent. And yet you still see the star very nicely. But you also have to put the pen light from the back, not from the front. Because the more transparent a material is, the less likely you will notice the star from the front. You'll have to either put it in a very dark background, or you'll have to look with the light coming from behind. Yeah. So they can be very beautiful. But you know, rose quartz being quartz, quartz is the dust of the earth. It's not the most expensive material there is. It's still very reasonably priced compared with a lot of other gem materials. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? No? OK. Nope. Fantastic. We're good. Then I shall leave that with you. Excellent. Thank you. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. If you are interested to learn a little bit more about gemstones and jewelry and would like to do so in a more structured way, I wanted to share with you a little bit more about our most popular course, which is our Gem and Jewelry Trade Secrets course. Now I have a brief video on that, and then I can share with you a little bit more about what it would be like to sign up for that. But uh, before I do that, I just wanted to remind you that we have many other gem jamming sessions here at the National Design Center. We have spotlights on different gemstones, we have focuses on how jewelry is designed and manufactured, and you are more than welcome to come back and join us for any of those sessions. We have them running several times a week. You, you love gemstones and jewelry, but how much do you really know about the rare and beautiful materials that are in your jewelry box? Join me, Tanya Sadow, for a complete hands-on certification that is guaranteed to change the way you appreciate and buy jewelry. Start your journey by traveling to the source. Learn about gemstone origins, see how gems are mined, and how these extraordinarily valuable materials get to the market. You'll learn how to spot good quality gemstones and how to assess value factors for diamonds, colored stones, phenomenal gems, pearls, organic gemstones, and even jade. This comprehensive course gives you the knowledge and power to take control of your gem purchases if you're a collector or an enthusiast, or your sales process if you're a designer or a jewelry professional. Beyond understanding about the gemstones and common trade practices in the jewelry industry, you will also see and learn about imitations, synthetics, and treatments that are sometimes used to enhance or even to deceive. This popular course takes place in our gem vault, 
where participants are able to see and examine my collection of over 1,800 gems and jewelry pieces, which include rare and valuable specimens, as well as common imitations found in the jewelry markets in the region. You will complete this course with a clear understanding of gem facts and will be able to avoid misconceptions that can lead to expensive mistakes when buying jewellery and gems. Here are some of the topics that we will cover in this exciting program. First, we'll learn about the wide variety of beautiful natural minerals and the many misconceptions which abound in this field, as well as how to classify and compare gemstones. Knowing more about these gems, we then learn to evaluate colour, discover how clarity types are assessed, and see a wide range of cutting styles available in today's market. Diamonds are the next on our agenda. First, we'll understand the modern diamond trade and then gain in-depth knowledge about the four C's, which consists of color, clarity, cut and carat weight, and which will be most helpful during your next diamond purchase. Next, we'll explore important differences between natural diamonds, synthetic diamonds, and diamond simulants, as well as some tips that will help you in the identification of these gem materials. Pearls are seeing a resurgence in popularity. Our next stop is to discover the varieties of pearls available and their origins, as well as common imitations in the market and ways to identify them. Pearls also have some unique value factors that you need to know about, such as color, luster, shape, make, naked thickness, and spotting. All of these significantly affect the price of pearls, and knowing them can help you make better buying decisions. Have you heard of asterism, chatoyancy, play of color, aventurescence, adulorescence, iridescence, or even labradorescence. These gemstone phenomena make certain gem materials really stand out from other gems, and knowing how to observe and evaluate these phenomena can help you to select the very best gemstone. Today, in Asia, no gemstone course would be complete without an understanding of jade. This popular material has tremendous cultural significance. But it has also been misunderstood for millennia. Learn about jadeite, or feichui, and nephrite, the two genuine forms of jade, and discover the many, many imitations available on the market today. Not all gemstones are minerals. Some gems are produced by living organisms. These are known as organic gems and have been appreciated by all cultures throughout time. Discover how gems like amber, jet, bone, ivory, shell, and even coral are used in jewelry today, and what to look out for when buying to ensure your purchases are responsible and sustainable. Our last stop is to understand the difference between imitations, synthetics, and assembled gemstones. Here you'll learn the importance of using the right equipment and techniques to test gems and will appreciate the complexity of the expert field of gemology. Like all JDMS courses, participants in the Gem and Jewelry Trade Secrets class receive everything they need to fully appreciate the gems, exhibits, and jewelry samples. This includes tools like the Jeweler's Loop and specialized pen lights and tweezers and gem cloths, as well as reference materials for all of the topics covered. Discover the sparkling world of gemstones and jewellery at JD Myers and see the gemstones in your own collection with a new appreciation. Find out more about our most popular course, Gem and Jewellery Trade Secrets, at jdmis.edu.sg. Great. So, um, for those of you that are in Singapore and are Singaporeans or permanent residents, you can actually get Skills Future training grants that cover 50 to 70% of your course fees. And if you're a Singaporean and you have Skills Future credits, you can also use those Skills Future credits to offset any remaining course fees. So you can get a quite substantial amount of the course fees covered, uh, if not covered completely, by uh, Skills Future grants and credits. 
this, oh, well, you missed, uh, my slide is missing, but uh, I just wanted to comment that this one is one of the more interesting programs that I think lends itself very, very well to our blended learning format. Um, blended learning means half of the course is online and half of the course is in the classroom. And when you're online, you have the ability to really see things close up that you wouldn't be able to see if you were just sort of looking at an instructor or looking at a, a PowerPoint. Um, you also get a chance to go back and understand things multiple times and you have a lifetime reference that you can go back and, and go through. But it's not really enough to understand and appreciate the gemstones, so that's why we have blended and you come into the classroom. Tanya has over 1,800 gem and jewelry exhibits that you get a chance to look at when you're understanding color to see all the different colors, uh, when you're understanding clarity to see the different types of clarity characteristics, etc. So that's super, super important to us. And with that, I'd like to say thank you everybody for joining us. Those of you that are joining us from YouTube, I'd like to thank you for spending time with us this evening and remind you that it makes a great difference to us if you can like and subscribe to the channel. Those of you that are here in class, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. We have a ton of really interesting content and we've got new stuff coming soon. So please do remember to do that. And thank you for joining us. Satish,